Praise the Lord. God bless you. I welcome you to a Sunday worship service. And I praise the Lord for how the Lord is keeping us. I appreciate the fact that you are there, strong, healthy, waiting for more of the blessings of God. The Lord will not disappoint any of us in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you and bless your name. We glorify you. You are a good God, a merciful God, a loving God, mighty God. And you are protecting everyone. We pray, Lord, that we will always be grateful for the great things you are doing in every life. And for the testimonies we are hearing. How you are healing those who are sick. You are delivering those who are oppressed. We are showing your love in manifold ways. We pray, Lord, that your love will never cease in any of our lives in Jesus' name. Once again, as we come to listen to you, we pray that your spirit, the Holy Ghost, will take the words we read and apply it to every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, I welcome you and appreciate the fact that we are here together to serve the Lord and worship the Lord together. Today, as you have learned from the time of searching the scriptures together, we actually read from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Open your Bible, we are going to do that even now. In Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 1. In verse 1 it says, And unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, This thing saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. It's telling us that Jesus Christ, the head of the church, is still very much in charge. You know, you might uh, think because of this problem and that problem, worldwide um, devastation, you might think that because of that, Christ is sitting back. No, not at all. He's still the one that is holding the seven stars in his right hand. I want to remind you that that word seven, that number seven, represents the entirety, the completeness of the people of God. All the members, all the ministers, all the children of God, all the servants of God, the Lord Jesus Christ holds the seven stars in their hands. And those seven stars, you'll be a star in the hand of the Lord in Jesus' name you will not fall. Your, your light will not grow dim. And it says you walk in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. That is, all the churches, if you go back to chapter 1, you can read that on your own. It says that the candlesticks are the churches. And it's walking in the midst of those seven golden candlesticks. And now it says in verse 2, it says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear with them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say the apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. I want you to underline those words, I know thy works. I'm sure you know this as a member of the church of the living God, and as a minister of the church of the living God, that Christ is the head of the church. And therefore, he knows everything. Just like a human being, you have head and you have body. There is nothing any member of the body can do that the head will not know. Hands cannot do anything. Feet cannot go anywhere. Heart cannot think anything. Eyes cannot see anything. Mouth cannot speak anything that the head will not know. No member of the body can say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to hide it from the head. He knows. And so Christ... As the head of the church, you know, he says, I know. I know what all the members are doing. They cannot do anything in secret, anything in the public that I will not know. I know thy works. And he's talking to you. And if you're doing well, you'll be happy that the Lord is saying, I know your works. If you are doing what is expected, what is desirable, what is good, and what is profitable, you must be very happy. As the Lord Jesus Christ says, others may not know, but I know. I know thy labor. I know that you are not 
Brook Lindsay, I know that you are not idle. I know your patience. You are patient in, in situations. And when you are prayed and the answer has not come, and say, so I believe God, I'm waiting for God. I believe, I know thy patience. And how thou canst not bear with them which are evil. You see, we mustn't deceive ourselves. There are people that close their eyes and they walk through life. And there are members of the church that close their eyes and they walk, you know, with closed eyes as if, you know, everybody carrying the Bible is all right. Everybody mentioning the name of Jesus is all right. Anybody that calls himself apostle and calls himself prophet and calls himself bishop, everyone is all right. But you know, Jesus wants us to discern. He wants us to differentiate. And he says to this church, he says to this minister, and he should be telling us, I know how thou canst not bear with them that are evil. The people that speak evil things and the people that do evil things and the people that go the evil way and the people that act in an evil way and you know that word evil is one letter short of the devil. The people that go the way of the devil they will do evil and you have tried them, you tested them, you examined them. They said they are apostles, they said they are the servants of God, but you know they are not. You have found them to be liars. And then in verse 3, he tells us in verse 3, and thou hast born and, and has patience. He mentions the patience again, the perseverance again, and for my name's sake has labored. He mentions the labor again, and he says this, For my name's sake you've done that, and has not fainted. And there's something about this church, oh, wonderful. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it tells us, it says, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which thing I also hate. You know, he's saying, as for doctrine, the people that came and they said were servants of God, were, were bishops and were, uh, were apostles, and you found their doctrines to be wrong and to be evil, you said, no, you will not allow them. Now the people that had deeds and the works and the examples that are evil, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, and you hate that as well. The Lord Jesus was commending this minister here, the angel of the church in Ephesus. I should be commending you, should be appreciating you. Look at verse 7. He now says in verse 7, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Hold on there. You know, maybe when you heard to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? To the minister, to the leader, to the pastor, to the preacher. Say, well, I'm excused today because I'm not a pastor, because I'm not an apostle. You know what it says? He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. The Lord is sending his message to the church. He's the head of the church and is sending his message to all the members of the church. Is the bridegroom, the husband, and is sending his message to the whole bride. Him that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. You see here, he's not talking to the world, he's talking to the church. He's talking to somebody. And he says, if we hear, if we do, if we practice, if we believe, if we follow all the instruction is given, if we follow the direction is leading us, it says to him that overcometh, will I give to each of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Well, say, so far, so good. Looking at the patience, so far, so good. And looking at the service, so far, and so good. And looking at all the labor, and all the perseverance, and all the patience, will say, so far, so good. But there's something now in verse 4. Let's come back to verse 4. It says in verse 4, Nevertheless, look at that. I have something in, uh, uh, that to commend you for, and the good things you have been doing. Uh, it says, but nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast led thy first love. I want you to underline those uh, last three words, thy first love. There is something Christ referred to as the first love. And there's also something uh, the word of God refers to as the first faith. Hold that. Number one is the first love. Number two, look at First Timothy chapter 5 
and verse 12. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Having damnation because they have cast off the false faith. Their false faith. Look at that again. Those last three words, their false faith. Their false faith. Number one is their false love. Number two is the false faith. Look at number three. Now we're back to Revelation chapter two and we're looking at verse five. It says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. Look at that, underline that too. The first works and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent. That's why we're looking at the message today, the priority of first faith, first love, first works. The priority, how essential it is, how important it is, how we should drive at it, how we should hold on to this, the priority of first faith, first love, and first works. There are three points we're looking at. Point number one is the precondition of the first faith. If we're going to have anything from the Lord, the precondition of the first faith, and that same first faith that we have, the faith that brought us into the kingdom, will keep us in the kingdom. That's why we cannot say, I'm born again, I'm a child of God, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That first faith must continue, because the faith that brought us in must keep us in. Point number two is the priority of the false love, the priority of the false love, the pride of Christ that has that false love in the Lord desirable. That false love we must keep to remain desirable and it is demanded of the Lord. That's why it says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you that you have left your false love and it says, remember, point number three is this preference for the first works. It's preference for the first works. Let's come back to number one. Number one is the precondition of the first faith. The precondition of the false faith. Now, let me explain something to you. When we mention faith, there are different kinds of faith. And let me tell you, number one, there is the natural faith. Natural faith. You know, in the family, a child has faith in the mother. A child has faith in the father. In the family, when the child, according to Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, if a child will ask his father, for bread, he believes he's going to have bread. He's not going to give him a stone. And if he asks for a fish, he believes he's going to have the fish. He's not going to have a scorpion or a serpent. There is the natural faith. Not only that, this might surprise you, but you know, there is devilish faith. Devilish faith. Have you ever heard that? You're going to read this now. Look at James uh, chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 19. James chapter 2, verse 19. It says in James chapter 2, verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou believest there is one God, that do I swear, the devils also believe and tremble. The devils also believe and tremble. So you cannot just say faith, faith, faith. Number one, there's natural faith. Number two, there's devilish faith. But you know, the devil believes there is God. Of course he believes that there is God. But he trembles. He does not repent. He knows that judgment is coming. And the judgment day could come any time. And yet, he does not repent. And so, we need to be watchful. What kind of faith do I have? Look at this in, uh, in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 verse 30. In Luke chapter 8 verse 30, it's talking about the demons that were to be cast out. And it says, And Jesus asked him, saying, what is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. Look at verse 31. In verse 31, it says, And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. Those are devils, those are demons, and those demons believed that Jesus had the power. 
that if he commanded them to go into the deep, that's exactly where they will go. If he told them to go into hell, that's exactly where they will go. Not to torment them before the day, before the time of their judgment. They believe. But they did not repent. The people that say, I believe, I believe, and they do not repent, they have the devil's faith. And the people that say, you know, I'm a trusting person, I trust everybody, that's just natural faith. The faith that matters now is the faith in Christ for salvation. Understand that? The faith in Christ for salvation. It says in uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, I read him from verse 12, uh, Acts chapter 4 verse 12, it says neither is there salvation in any other. When you believe that, and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, that's the faith we're talking about, when you believe that, that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, and he died for you, he died to take your sin away, and you put that personal faith, personal trust, personal confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ and you say, praise the Lord, I am saved. That's the faith we're talking about. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's why the precondition of entry to the kingdom of God, the precondition of staying, abiding in the kingdom of God, the precondition of enduring to the end so that we'll be there on that final day when the saints are marching in, you'll be there, I'll be there. The precondition is faith. Look at three things here under the precondition of the false faith. I was looking at Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and verse 15. Conversion, the precondition is to have faith in the Lord, faith in Christ. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. What's that? That you don't have to die in your sin. Christ has come. It's the, it's the one that has brought peace, the peace we can have with God, the relationship, reconciliation we can have with God. Hear the good news. Believe the good news. Look at verse 15 now. It says in verse 15, saying, the time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's it. When you believe that, that Jesus Christ is the Savior, and you turn away from sin, and you turn to the Savior and say, Jesus is my Savior. Personal. It's not just that Jesus died on the cross. And Jesus is good. Jesus is merciful. He died for me. He shed his blood for me. He's taking my sins away. And the Spirit of God will be a witness in your heart. You are a child of God. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. That is the first faith that we have. And that is the faith that gets us into the kingdom. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 21. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. We're looking at verse 21. He's telling us now, he says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. is showing the only way and the one way by which we can be saved, by which we can be reconciled unto God, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Look at this. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God, turning away from all sin, turning away from all evil, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Well then, to enter into the kingdom, to be converted, to be changed, to be transformed, and to have a new life, here is the condition, repentance and faith in Christ. And now, after being saved, after giving our lives to the Lord, and now we know that we are born again, we are children of God, there must be consistency, there must be continuation, there must be constancy. That brings me to the second part, consistency with the righteousness of faith. Consistency 
constancy, you are constant about this consistency of the righteousness of faith. Look at Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 6. It says, but the righteousness, which is of faith, not self-righteousness, this is not, you know, I'm better than other people. Uh, my good works are more than my bad works. They have not come to Christ. They don't know Christ as Savior. And they're just trying and trying and trying. They are, it may be a moderate, good, moral life. That's not it now. This is the righteousness that comes by faith. And it says, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart. Who shall ascend into heaven? That he is to bring Christ down from above. And we are not saying that, well, I want to be like Paul the Apostle. He saw Jesus Christ on the way to Damascus. I'm waiting. Let somebody, let somebody pray and let an angel tell Christ to come down from heaven and appear to me. He says, no, you have faith that Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God and he has done everything he ought to do for your salvation and therefore you are not asking him who shall ascend into heaven to bring Christ down from above look at uh, verse 7 it says in verse 7 or who shall descend into the deep you believe in the resurrection already that Jesus Christ was crucified that he died, that he was buried. On the third day, he rose triumphantly. And because you believe he rose again, you are not saying, oh, he's going to descend into the deep. That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. That has happened already. And you believe that already in your heart, that Jesus died for you, that Jesus rose for your justification. And then he says in verse 8, it says, but what says it? The word is near thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. The word of faith which you hear. The word of faith which you take in. The word of faith which you give your, your consent to. The word of faith that you understand and you believe in your heart. Look at verse 9 now. Here is how the righteousness of faith, here is how it comes. And here is how it continues that if thou, if thou understand, not if we it's not a kind of a communal, a corporate faith. It's a personal faith in the Lord that makes you to continue. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart. You believe in your heart. You hear that something is happening somewhere. You are not panicking and saying, I hope I make the rapture. You are not hoping. You believe and you are sure beyond any shadow of doubt. Jesus Christ is my Savior. I confess that with my mouth. I believe it in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Look at that. And then in verse 10, it says in verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That's the only way. That's the only way. It's not, I'm trying to walk righteousness. I'm trying to be righteous. I'm trying to turn over a new leaf. I'm trying to make resolution. I'm trying my best. Your salvation is in Christ the Savior. And your assurance is in the fact that he died for you. Your assurance is in the fact that he rose again. And there is no doubt in your heart. You give your life to the Lord. And whosoever comes unto me, I will in no wise cast off. For what the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Look at this. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation with your own mouth. It's not that one pastor will tell you, now you are saved. It's not that one um, a person doing follow-up will say, don't doubt, you are saved. You are the one to believe in your heart. And you are the one to confess with your mouth. And that is made unto salvation. And I pray that that will be confirmed in your heart, in your life, in Jesus' name. Look at Galatians chapter chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 5. In Galatians chapter 5, looking at verse 5, For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Of righteousness by faith. Not righteousness by works. Not righteousness by trials. 
not righteousness by self-punishment, not righteousness by rolling on the ground, not righteousness by trying to pay for all the bad things you've done. You believe that Jesus Christ has carried all the load, all the guilt, everything he has carried away. And you say, now we through the Spirit were waiting for the hope of the righteous, the hope that when Christ will come, we will be with him and we will go with him. Let's make it personal that you in particular, if nobody around you uh, makes it, you will make it in Jesus' name. And you have that waiting attitude for the hope of righteousness by faith. Look at verse 6 and see what that faith does for in Jesus Christ. Neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith that walketh by love. But faith that walketh by love. It tells us conversion. That's the commencement of the Christian life. The beginning of the Christian life. It is by repentance and faith. Now the continuation after the commencement, it is by consistency and constancy with the righteousness of faith. And now there is a confirmation. A confirmation in our lives. The people that see us will know that we are believers. The people that know us, they look at our lives. They look at our language, they look at our disposition, they look at everything we do. They see that things have changed since Christ came in. And since we gave our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ in our spirit, the spirit is confirming. In our soul, even our mind is confirming. And in our neighborhood, the people around us, they can see that things are totally different. There is confirmation from within. There's confirmation from without. There's confirmation from heaven. And there's confirmation on earth. Look at this. The confirmation we have through the renewal of faith. Renewal of faith. You see, when you are born again, you have faith in Christ. It's the faith that brought you into the kingdom. But you know, day by day, you're renewing that faith in the Lord. And you're saying, I believe in the past. I believe now. I'll continue to believe in the future. Confirmation through the renewal of faith. Look at Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 20. It says, I am. Not only that I was, I am. Not only that I will be, I am. Every day I'm renewing my commitment. Every day I'm renewing my faith. Every day I'm saying I belong to Christ. I'm a child of God. The blood of Jesus has cleansed me. And the blood of Jesus keeps cleansing me from all sin. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Present tense. Christ liveth in me. Satan does not live in you anymore. You are a child of God. And sin does not abide in you anymore. You are a child of God. And the weakness, the faith is making you. In your weakness, you are strong. In Jesus' name, temptation may come. Trials may come. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. What does that mean? In the flesh, in the world. In my day-to-day -day activities, the life that I live in the natural, the life that I now live as I interact with friends and with people around me, as I do what I need to do, it says the life which I now live in the flesh. I live, look at this, I live, look at this, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You're always remembering, he gave himself for you. He gave himself for you. Any, any time any doubt wants to come, he gave himself for me. He loved me, even me, and he gave himself for me. And because of that, you are living by faith, you are walking by faith. Every time you look at Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. In Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. But what does that mean? We we'll walk by faith in Christ and not by sight. Anything does lean up before you. Any sight before you. You exalt Christ above that. I'm not going to walk by sight. I'm not going to walk by the wind blowing. I'm not going to walk by all the things, the challenges I see around me. Christ will 
overcome that thing I see by my sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And then he tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. In Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse 20 now. He's telling us, he says, now unto him that is able. That's how you are walking every time. Any sickness, my God is able. My Christ is able. Any temptation, my Christ is able. Any challenge, my Christ is able. Any seed that comes and he wants to, you know, cross your life and, and makes you to be downtrodden and makes you to fall. I know that my God, my Christ is able, is the conqueror and he conquered for me. Now, unto him that is able, look at this, to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or seek according to the power that worketh in us. As you move around, you're not moving around like somebody who is empty, like somebody who doesn't have any strength, like somebody who doesn't have any backbone. You know that Christ is there. Christ liveth in me. And because he lives in me, I can pray and he will give me, he will do exceeding abundantly all that I ask and all that I think and above all that I ask or think and it's according to the power that worketh in us. Look at that. Not according to the power that worked in Galilee, that worked in Jerusalem, that worked 2,000 years ago and we don't know what is happening today. Today, at this very time, that power is working in the believer. And that power will keep on working in you. That's the confirmation. And now as we look at Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 16. Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 16. It says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able. It says, God is able. God is able. Now he says, you will be able. Give me a good amen. You are able now. Anything, you'll thrash that sin. You'll conquer that sin. You'll walk all over that sin. Because it says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench. How many darts of the wicked one? Tell me, tell me. I said, how many darts of the wicked one are you able to conquer? All the fiery darts of the wicked. That tells us then the precondition of the false faith. We're coming to point number two now. It is the priority of a false love, of the false love. Come back to Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, we're looking at verse 4. Revelation chapter 2 verse 4, it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast led thy false love. I need to explain to you once again, there are different kinds of love. Different kinds of love. Number one, there is natural love. Natural love. Do you remember that Jacob loved Joseph because he was the son of his old age that you find in Genesis chapter 37 and verse 3. It says, because this is my son of the old age, I've been waiting for the mother to give me a child. And eventually at the old age, the child came and he loved him more than all his bread. That one is natural love. Do you remember Isaac and Esau? Isaac loved Esau. Because of the venison, because of the food, the meat that he ate from Esau, because Esau was a hunter. That's natural love. On the other hand, Rebekah loved a Jacob because of what she had known about Jacob. That's just family love. And that is natural love. And so the love the Lord is talking about here when he says, Thou hast led thy first love is not just the natural love. Look at the mother. And she and the child, they want to cross the road. And the child mistakenly goes ahead of the mother. And the vehicle is coming. And the mother will not think of anything, whether the mother is saved or not saved. Born again or not born again, she rushes there to catch the child and to save the life of the child from a terrible accident. That is natural love. Apart from natural love, there is a erotic love, eros in the Greek. And that eros, erotic love, is fleshly love. 
Do you remember uh, Delilah telling Samson uh, and saying, You say you love me and your heart is not with me. And you have not told me the secret of your strength. That it, one is errors. That one is uh, fleshly. That one is lost. And that's not the kind of love he's talking about. He's talking about, now number three, is the divine love. Is the God kind of love. Is agape love. It is that divine love. The Lord Jesus Christ is talking about, for God so loved the world. That's divine love. That's heavenly love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Now, that kind of love that Jesus Christ expected, the first love, and he said, you have left your first love. How do we understand that? Look at three things now under the priority of the first love. Number one is the continuation of full Fireproof love. Think about that. The continuation of full fireproof love. What kind of love is that? When we say something is fireproof, there's a cabinet. And they say that cabinet is fireproof. That means whatever fire may rage, whatever it is, whatever is inside, that uh, cabinet is safe because it is fireproof. The same thing you know, when your love is so much that no fire can destroy that love. That fireproof love and that full love that you are not diminishing, it abides, it remains there. Number one is the continuation of full fireproof love. Look at um, John chapter 15, reading from verse 9. In John chapter 15, verse 9, as the Father has loved me, full love, Complete love, entire love, fireproof love, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. It tells us in verse 10, look at verse 10. It says in verse 10, if ye keep my commandments, and ye shall abide in my love. It's not just, you know, an empty love, a shallow love. A love that does nothing, a love that says nothing, a love that gives nothing, it is full. And it is uh, relating with Christ. And it is a flowing love that flows to Christ all the time. It says, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That's the full love. It says in verse 11, in verse 11 it says, these things have I spoken unto you. That my joy might continue, might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Look at verse 12. It says in verse 12, This is my commandment, that she love one another. Now, because the members of the church, the people of God, they are related to Christ, and because we love Christ, we love his people, we love his body, we love his members, we love his followers, we love his disciples. That same love, full love, that same love, fireproof love, that same love that fire cannot destroy, that same love that fire cannot do anything to, that fire cannot devastate. This is my commandment, that she love one another as I, look at that, as I, Think about that as I walk on that, as I have loved you. He says in verse 13, he says, Greater love as no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. A man lay down his life for his friends. It means it's not just a word of mouth. It's not loving in tongue. It's not loving in profession. It's real. It's definite. And it is practical, it is visible, it is observable. Greater love as no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his praise. Look at Hebrews chapter 13 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 1, it says, Let brotherly love continue. It's telling us that, you know, the love is talking about, it's not the love of, you know, years gone by, it doesn't continue. First love, it says, remember, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works again. Bring back that same love, let brotherly love continue. It tells us in First Peter chapter 1 verse 7, 
First Peter chapter 1, it tells us in verse 7, it says, Whom that sh the trial of your faith be more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ. It says, the fire will come, fire of persecution, fire of misunderstanding, fire of misrepresentation, all that fire will burn, and then it tries the faith, and it tries the love, and the faith and the love will remain until the appearing of Christ. Look at verse 8. In verse 8 it says, Whom have you not seen, ye love? Although you are not seeing him in the physical. You pray, he doesn't show up physically. But you know he's there. And his presence is there. You believe his promise, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He says, Whom have you not seen, ye love? In whom do now you see him not, yet believing, faith and love, love and faith. You love him, you believe him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. It tells us in Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 35, this is the fireproof love. This is the love that although the fire may rage, although the persecution may come, all those difficulties and challenges may come. Fireproof love, the love is still there. Like the fireproof cabinet, everything is still intact in the cabinet. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, does a fire? Or distress, does a fire? Or persecution, does a fire? Or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? In verse 36, it says, as it is written, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But look at verse 37. Nay, in all these things, whatever fire may rage, whatever persecution may rise, whatever opposition may confront us, it says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I was thinking, he loves me. The world is uh, doing whatever they want. He loves me. And the sea is rolling in. Uh, that doesn't cancel his love. I know he loves me. Trials are coming. And they're coming in quick succession. And it says, I know he loves me. And that makes me more than a conqueror. When I know that whatever happens, whatever I see, whatever I feel, whatever moves around, I know he loves me. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Look at verse 38. In verse 38, for I am persuaded, I am persuaded, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come. is brought everything together. Things like death or life, down or up. Angels, principalities or powers. Things present, pandemic or epidemic. Or things to come, which we don't know. It says, all these things, verse 39, it says, No height, no depth, no any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That love of God, that love of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're coming now to another consideration. Because it says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you, that you have left your false love. When the love becomes feeble, when the love becomes fickle, when the love becomes false, when the love does not continue, the condemnation of feeble, fickle love. The condemnation of feeble, fickle love. Look at Galatians chapter 4, reading from verse 15. 
Here Paul the Apostle was asking the Galatian believers because he saw that their first love, the fervency of their first love, the heat of their first love, all that has grown cold, has uh, gone down. And it says, where is then the blessedness you speak of? He said, what is the love that you spoke of, that you demonstrated? that you exhibited, that you expressed in days gone by. When you first knew the Lord, that's what the Lord is asking us to you. And he's saying, where is then the blessedness of the Lord? You speak of, for I bear you record, that if it had been possible, you would have plugged out your own eyes, and have given them to me. But that kind of love was not there anymore. That's why he was saying, your love is grown cold. Your love is become feeble. Your love is become fickle. Your love is fading. It's no more there. Look at Matthew chapter 24, and reading from verse 12. Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 12. It says, because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. People now follow the Lord cold heartedly. And the enthusiasm is no more there. The excitement is no more there. And the pursuit is no more there. The zeal is no more there. The passion is no more there. Because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. In verse 13, it says in verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, I pray you'll endure to the end, that your love will continue till the end. That your passion and your zeal will continue till the end. That your consecration will continue till the end. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I pray that your love will not fade. Say amen. Your love will not become feeble. Your love will not become fickle, and you'll not fall by the wayside in Jesus' name. If that is going to be so, you must renew your consecration, and you must renew your devotion to the Lord, and your decision that you have made unto the Lord. That's why the Lord said, check up, check up, where the love was, how the love was, and come back and get away from the fading, feeble, fickle love. Look at uh, section 3 now. It's the consecration with fixed, fervent love. The consecration with fixed, fervent love. Look at uh, Songs of Solomon. We're reading from chapter 8 and verse 6. Songs of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Open your Bible. Underline this. Your Bible set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. Look at this. But love is strong as death. Love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which has a most vehement flame. He's talking about love. And he says, even the coals of fire cannot destroy that love. That's what we said in section 1, fireproof love. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, it says, many waters cannot quench love. First love, first love. The first love we have for the master. The first love we have for the Lord. It says, many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floors drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it will utterly be content. It's telling us that this love we fix on Christ, this love that is fervent, this love that is hot, this love that is passionate, this love that is compassionate, and this love that flows freely unto the Lord without any restriction, we will not allow any fire, any persecution, any action of man, any action of society to drown it, to drain it, or to destroy it. Look at First Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we're looking at verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, we must first of all have the purity of heart. That's what will keep the love where it ought to be. 
the blood of Jesus must cleanse. The blood of Jesus must what? The blood of Jesus must purify. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love. Unfeigned love. Unpretending love. A love that is deep. A love that is hot. A love that is fervent, the love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. It's, it's a kind of love that continues serving the Lord. A kind of love that we feel in that is flowing unto the Lord. A kind of love we remember. That's the first love. That's the way it was. And that's the way I want to continue. You'll continue in Jesus' name. I come to point number three now. In point number three, we have the preference for the first works. The preference for the first works. We're coming to Revelation chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 5. Revelation chapter 2 verse 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Remember therefore is already told you know the minister. He's told the members. He's told the disciples. He's told us. He's told the church because he says he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches. That's what he's telling us. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works and do the first works. What does that mean? First faith produced first works. First love produced first works. And as we remember, as we recollect, as we recall how it was, how it used to be, we turn around, we say, yes, I accept rebuke, I accept the reproof, I accept the observation of the head of the church. He cannot make a mistake. He's told me how my love was and how my love is today. I'm making the comparison here the one of the day is lower than the one of the past days. So I need to raise this one that is lower. I have to go back to the first love and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove the candlestick, the candlestick out of its place except thou repent. He wants us to understand uh, there are the first works coming out of the first love. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, Christ's requirement of the first works. Christ's requirement of the first works. Look at John chapter 6, reading from verse 28. In John chapter 6, reading from verse 28, Then said they unto him, What shall we do? that we might walk the works of God. How do you understand that? The people asked, the Jews asked, what shall we do? What are we going to put in place that we will walk the works of God? Look at verse 29. Verse 29 says, Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God. This is the beginning of the work of God. This is the commencement of the work of God. This is the first works. It says, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. He said, that's the expectation of the Lord, that he sent his only begotten son. And if your faith is shifting from that foundation, if your faith is shifting from that Savior, this is returning so the first works that now you believe on him that the father have sent that brings salvation look at titus chapter 2 reading from verse 14 titus chapter 2 reading from verse 14 who gave himself for us you are believing on the lord jesus christ you have your confidence on the Lord Jesus Christ. You pin your hope on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's the only way and it's the only source of salvation. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself 
a peculiar people. Look at this. Zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. You see, when we come to the Lord, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the commencement. That's the beginning. And then we come to Him. He purifies us. He sanctifies us. He takes that Adamic nature away from us, from our heart. The Adamic nature has a downward pull. It has a deadly pull. It has a deafening pull. The Adamic nature does not allow a person to hear very well. Does not allow a person to run fast. Does not allow a person to be free in believing and doing the work of God. He takes that away. He purifies you unto himself, a peculiar person, a peculiar believer. And now you're zealous of good works. Something is going to happen. Everywhere you go, you want people to know I'm a child of God. I believe in the Lord. I'm saved. Everywhere you go, you want them to see the work of the gospel in your heart. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, look at this. It says, let your light so shine. Let your light so shine before men. That's the work. That's the work. The light is now shining. The gospel is now beaming forth. Even in your life, in your character, everybody can see that's the work, that's the work, the good works. You are not going to hide your Christian faith. I don't want to show up. I don't want people to know I'm a believer. I don't want people to know I'm deep in Christ. I don't want people to know I'm deep alive. I don't want people to know my light is shining. I want to hide my light under a bushel. No. The false works, the excitement you have, and the enthusiasm you have. I'm a child of God. Let your light so shine before me that they may see, here is it, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, sometimes uh, something may crop up uh, with a neighbor or somebody will say, I'm sorry I can't do that. Not pride. I'm sorry I cannot go that way. It's not because I'm better than anybody else. But you know, I'm a born again Christian. I'm a child of God. Because of that, I cannot go that direction again. That is the first works, the way we used to pin everything on the watch of God. Let your light now so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Actually, it makes us ready every time to act right, to behave right, to do well, to help people, to uplift people. We were very eager. I'm looking for somebody to help. I'm looking for somebody to lift up. And I'm ready for service every time. That brings us to the second section. Constant readiness for fruitful work. Constant readiness for fruitful work. Uh, you, you have the understanding that Christ has given you a work to do. As a portion, a work for you to do. We're not talking of, you know, I'm a worker in the church. That's wonderful. I love it. Please continue. But we're talking about the work he has given you to do in life. You know, in your neighborhood, like the good Samaritan, you see somebody suffering, you pick him up. You see somebody indigent, you give to them. And the Lord has assigned us to take care of his creatures and to take care of, of the believers. Look at Mark chapter 13. And reading from verse 34, Mark chapter 13, verse 34, it says, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey. Look at this. Who left his house and he gave authority to his servants and to every man his work. And to every man his work. And to every man his work. And commanded the porter to watch. He's giving you a work to do. A walk to save lives in your community. A walk to encourage people in your community. A walk to lift up those who are falling in your community. A walk to, to age and to add to what Christ would have done. If Christ were there, he'll preach to that neighbor. He'll help that neighbor. He'll give whatever he has. If he has to multiply food, he will give to that neighbor. He will help everyone. It is the work that is fruitful and we're ready every time. Look at Titus chapter 
Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 8, it says, This is a faithful sin, and in these things I will, that thou affirm constantly, that thou affirm constantly, that thou affirm and observe constantly, that they which have believed in God, look at this, might be careful, might be watchful, might be observant to maintain good works. You're, you're checking up among the brethren, anybody in need there, you're watchful, you want to maintain good works. And, you want, and it doesn't matter whether the person is of this tribe, of that tribe, from my tribe, from your tribe, from our tribe, is from the east or from the north, it doesn't matter at all. You just want to do good unto everyone. You're careful and you're watchful and you are ready to maintain good works these things are good and profitable unto men. You'll not do anything that is not profitable to your neighbor, anything that is discouraging to your neighbor, anything that will push your neighbor down. You're looking at how you can increase the joy and the life that that person lives, how you can make that person more profitable. Look at verse 14. This one is important. Verse 14. And let ours also learn. Let ours also learn. You see, I don't know how to talk to people. I I don't know how to approach people. I don't know how to help people. It's in my heart. I want to do it, but I don't know how to do it. You see what it says? Let ours, the believers who belong to the Lord, let them also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. You will not be fruitless in Jesus' name. Amen. You will not be fruitless in Jesus' name. Let's come to section 3 now. Crowning rewards for faithful work. Everything you do for the glory of his name, everything you do for the upliftment of the believers in Christ, everything you do to bring sinners to the Lord, the Lord will reward you. It's a crowning work we're doing. It's a good work we're doing. Crowning rewards for faithful work. It tells us Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, we're reading from verse 25. Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 25. It says, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. You have the first faith, hold fast till I come. You have the first love, hold fast till I come. And you have the first works and the good works and the godly works, hold fast till I come. Look at verse 26. In verse 26 it says, And he that overcometh, who is that? And he that overcometh, that's me. I said that's me. You'll overcome in Jesus' name. Trial, you'll overcome. Temptation, you'll overcome. Discouragement, you will overcome. Sickness, you will overcome. Any arrow, any attack, you will overcome. I'm talking to an overcomer this glorious Sunday. You are an overcomer in Jesus' name. And he that overcometh and keepeth, look at this, and keepeth my works. Huh, look at that. My works. The works of Christ, what Christ would have done, what Christ would have been doing if he were on your street, in your neighborhood, what Christ would have been doing, would have been preaching the gospel, would have been telling others of the way of life, would have been pointing to his death that will save them, would have been pointing to his coming again. He will be lifting up people, encouraging people, enlightening people, opening their eyes to see according to the scriptures. Keep it my works unto the end. That first works, that first faith, that first love, that you keep unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, and he shall rule. And he shall rule. Looks like you want to rule. And looks like you are going to reign with Christ. When he comes and he sets up his kingdom, you will be there. And you will rule in Jesus' name, be an overcomer, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall be broken to shivers. 
even as I received of my father. In verse 28, it says, in verse 28, and I will give him, he will give you, and I will give him the morning star. And in verse 29 now, it says the same thing, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. We're talking to people, we're preaching to people that have ears to ear, and that is you. You're going to bring the first love back, you're going to bring the first faith back, and you're going to do the first works again, and the Lord will crown you on the final day in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 11. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. We've been talking about the coming of Christ. And we've talked about the rapture, about the great tribulation, and about his second coming. And the Lord can come any time from now. What work have you done to merit reward and the crown when he comes? How have you brought back your first faith? Since you have heard now, he says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. That you have left your first faith. How are you bringing back the first? Remember, he is coming. And how are you bringing back the first works that you did that Christ will record down, that Christ will say that's desirable, that's profitable, and that will win the crown. He says, Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. No man take thy crown. You, you understand? When the devil brings temptation, He's watching. He wants you to fall to that temptation to take your crown. When there's persecution and then you're crying for the devil, you'll never cry for the devil again. I said you'll never cry again. The devil is watching so you'll be weak, you'll be down, your hands will, you know, go down, your shoulders will go down. I don't know what to do again. That's what the devil is waiting for. He wants to take your crown. He will not take your crown. No man will take your crown in Jesus' name. He says, behold, I come quickly. He'll come sooner than you thought and sooner than you expect. Hold that fast. Your first faith, hold it fast. The doctrine of the word, hold it fast. Your conviction, hold it fast. And your consecration, hold it fast. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man, no man, no man take thy crown. Nobody will take my crown. Say it for yourself. Nobody will take my crown. Nobody will take your crown. In Jesus' name, you will endure unto the end. You will believe unto the end. And you will keep on doing good works unto the end. And you'll keep on serving the Lord fervently and joyfully and happily and cheerfully. In Jesus' name, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer now. And we're going to say, Lord, I've heard your word today. And I've seen what I ought to be. I've seen what I ought to do, and I've seen that this first love I must bring back, and the first faith I must bring back, and the first works I must do. Rise up now, rise up now. Or if you want to kneel down, but make sure you are not leaning down and sleeping. Don't sleep. This is the time to pray for more of the grace of God, more of the goodness of God, and more of the mercy of God, and more of the strength of the Lord, and more of the power of the Lord in our lives. Open your mouth. Tell the Lord in prayer. Tell the Lord in prayer. It's not a time for meditation. It's not a time for thinking. It's the time for bringing all that we have learned to the Lord in prayer. It's the head of the church. Thank, thank the Lord. Christ is your head. Christ is my master. Christ is my Lord. Christ is all in all for me. Christ is my savior. And Christ is my redeemer. And Christ is my sanctifier. And he knows we're not worshiping an ignorant God and ignorant Christ. He says, I know. I know your works. He knows everything we've done. He knows where we've been. And because he knows everything, that's why we're coming to him. And we're saying, oh Lord, here am I. I expose myself unto you. Let him see everything. Let him examine everything. Let him evaluate everything. And then he'll pour the oil of gladness and the oil of comfort into your vessel. He'll trim your lamb so that your lamb will burn brighter. 
It will make you one of the wise virgins that the extra oil will be there and the lamb will be burning. And when you will hear, behold, he cometh, your heart will be awake. Your mind will be awake to receive the Lord when he comes. He says, I know your patience. How patient are you? I know your perseverance. How, how persevering are you? And I know how you have tested the people. You have tried the people who say they are apostles and they are not. You are not taking everybody. I'm a prophet. I'm a bishop. I'm an apostle. You are not just taking them. You are looking at their works. By their works, you shall know them. And you have tried them who say they are apostles and they are not. And you have not given your attention to them. You will not give attention to false prophets. That's part of your first love. You love the Lord so much. You love Christ so much. You love your Savior so much. You love the Redeemer so much. You will not love error. You will not love any deception. You will not love any falsehood. And then he says this, you also have, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which are also hate, the things which are not of God, the things that are false. You hate everything. And you're saying, oh Lord, here am I, oh Lord, here am I. I love everything you love. I hate everything you hate. You hate evil, I hate evil. You hate false doctrine, I hate false doctrine. You hate um, satanic things. I hate satanic things. You hate occultism. I hate occultism. You hate carelessness and the works of the flesh. And I hate carelessness and the works of the flesh. The things Christ hates, I hate. And then what he now says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. Lord, what do you have against me? You are not as prompt in obeying the Lord as you used to. You are not as consistent in obeying the Lord as you used to. And you are not as fervent in loving the Lord as you used to. And you are not deep in consecration as you used to. And you are not consistent in restricting temptation as you used to. It says, I have somewhat against you that you have left your first love. Check up, check up. What's your love? How is your love before the Lord? Is it full? Is it fireproof? Or is it fading? Is it feeble? Is it fecal? Or is it coming back again and it is fixed on Christ and it is focused on Christ and you are looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith and you will not allow anything to derail you, anything to distract you, anything to make you get discouraged. You are looking at the Lord and the Lord alone. He says, remember, remember and recall. Remember, recollect your first love, how you obeyed the Lord, how you fervently served the Lord. He says, remember and repent. What does that mean? Lord, I'm sorry for that going down. I'm sorry for that yielding to discouragement. I'm sorry for that not quickly, promptly doing what you expect me to do. I'm sorry for that. Closing my mouth when I ought to open my mouth and declare the goodness of the Lord and preach the gospel to everyone around me. Lord, I'm sorry. I've been slow in running the errand of the Lord. That's what he means. That's what he means. He says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent, repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. At any consecration you've taken away from the altar, he wants you to put it on the altar again. And he wants you to bring all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your skill, everything you've got in serving the Lord. And you're not just managing serving the Lord, just managing worshiping the Lord. You say everything now, I bring everything unto you. I consecrate all that I am, all that I have, all that I've got, all that I possess, I consecrate to the service of the Lord. And I look around, I'm going to help people around. I'm going to lift up people around. I'm going to encourage people around. And I'm going to do what Christ will have done to the people around me. Even though the priests might neglect them, the Levites might neglect them, I'm going to be like the good Samaritan and I'm going to touch the people, I'm going to help the people, I'm going to encourage the people, I'm going to care for the people. 
because you have done it in as much as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. You have done it unto me. Look for a way to hell. Look for a way to lift up. And look for a way to make people make progress in the things of the Lord. Consecrate your time. Consecrate your treasure. Consecrate everything you've got to the service of the Lord. And the Lord will reward you. And then the day will come when he will crown you. When he will crown you. The Lord is about to come. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast that you have. Don't fall. Don't falter. Don't fade away. And don't allow the goodness in you to fade away. Keep on standing. Standing firm. Keep on standing. Standing focused. And keep on standing uncompromisingly, unwaveringly, that you continue to serve the Lord until the trumpet will sound, until the dead in Christ will rise, until we which are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And then we'll be with him. Not only that, he will reward every one of us because we kept the first law. Because we kept the first faith. Because we recovered the first works and we continued until the end. The grace to continue, the Lord gave unto you. The strength to continue, the Lord gave unto you. And the focus to continue, the Lord gave unto you. The steadfastness to continue, the Lord gave unto you. The ability to hold fast until he comes, the Lord grant unto you. Father, we thank you for this service. We thank you for how you have reminded us of the first law, the first faith, and the first works. And we thank you, Lord, because you have not given up on us. You want us to come back to where we were as consecrated, even more consecrated than we were, as devoted, even more devoted than we were in the past. And Lord, we'll bring everything once again. I will promise you that we're going to serve you, we're going to follow you, we're going to obey you, we'll deny ourselves, we'll do everything it takes to keep on loving you more than ever before. And to love you above all things, above all material things, above anything around us, above anything of the present, anything of the past, to love you with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. And we pray, Lord, the works that ought to follow that law, fireproof law, full law, fervent law, fixed law, focused law, fruitful law, faithful law. Lord, we pray, the works that follow that, you give unto every one of us in Jesus' name. We will not be idle. We will not be unprofitable. We will not uh, fall down. We will not go back. But we are going to keep on serving you like you demand, like you require. And Lord, we pray, we will keep on doing that one day at a time and every day. Confirm it in our lives, Lord. Make us happy Christians, holy Christians, heavenly-minded Christians, everywhere we go, living as if the Lord might come today at this very moment. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And everybody said, Amen.